very kind to Australians here. I really appreciate it. Well, here we go. Genesis chapter 1. Tonight we intend to read the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 1. Hey, to all the musicians, you've done an awesome job. You've just been leading us into the praise of Jesus all weekend. It's been sensational. And thank you for having me. You really have been a great church to host me. And uh, we've enjoyed it. Been hanging out with some great people. And uh, God's doing a good thing. How many people believe that, that the greatest church Hamilton's ever seen is yet to be built? I, I really do. But for that to happen, you and I have got to get some stuff. It's really, really cool to see all the young people out. If you're under 21 years of age, just give me a bit of a wave. You're not all telling me the truth right about now. I feel very, very comfortable amongst you. I, um, I spent 22 years in youth ministry. And uh, a lot of that was with a ministry in Australia called Youth Alive, which I led for a long time. I've left Youth Alive, as you can tell. And uh, my son has encouraged me to start another one called Barely Alive. <laughs> <laughs> They're very kind. But every Sunday night, we just we jam one of the, the, the ballroom at the Brisbane Convention Centre with people your age and just doing life and seeing them come alive. I'm very excited just to see what, I, what I'm picking up in the younger generation of this church. I'm also finding there's a whole lot of granddads and grandmas that have got a great young spirit in this place. I, uh, I actually read a, a great, great little note one day. I was just reading some things in a, in a magazine. There was a, there was a note in a card. A little girl had heard her grandma had just had a birthday and a little girl had heard that grandma, you know, people were saying, your grandma's gone over the hill. So she wrote to grandma and said, dear grandma, I'm really worried. People will say you've gone over the hill. And grandma wrote back and said, sweetheart, it's true, but I only went over the hill to pick up speed. <laughs> and I, I just sense that. I, I, I sense if you continue to stay young in spirit, look out. You ain't seen nothing yet. I love that. Oh, as soon as you said Backman Turner Overdrive, b -b 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 baby. You did a good job for a man with the start of that guy. I thought it was fantastic. Who hasn't got a, a clue what they were talking about with Backman Turner Overdrive? Go to the museum, you'll find out. <laughs> Stand up, Pastor Ian. What do you think of that shirt? I find you a very attractive man. <laughs> Don't go too close to Clyde. He was kissing men this morning. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Brisbane's Fortitude Valley, and if you know where that is, you'll know that I, I can cope with that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We live in a society that's image conscious. You can tell by Ian's shirt. It's people telling you how to dress, what brands to wear, how you should look. We live in an, in an image conscious world. And it's imperative that we know who we are and it's imperative that we know what image we should carry. I'm here tonight to tell you, a lot of you have been told you it's not a good thing to be image conscious. I'm here to tell you that you need to be image conscious. But you need to know whose image you're meant to carry. I, I'm impacted by many, many things. I, I heard it said this morning, and Clive was uh, speaking to us prior to the offering, that, that he gets inspired by movies. So do I. My life's been changed by some of those great classics like Toy Story, <laughs> Shrek, <laughs> Nemo, <laughs> The Castle. <laughs> Dale dug a hole.
Let's not go there. Some of the great movies, some of the great TV programs too, the deep teachings of The Simpsons changed my life. Now, I know some of you don't watch The Simpsons because you're Christians, and if it makes you happy, then neither do I. But I have some non-Christian friends that watch them and tell me what they're about, and, and it makes me really laugh. There have been some amazing Simpson programs. Some of you remember one of the classics. It would have to be six or seven years old now when Lisa Simpson had a, a part-time relief teacher in her school. His name was Mr. Bergstrom. He was a Jewish man. Ah, I just heard all the ones that watched The Simpsons. Oh, yeah, mm. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Bergstrom was a classic. He... he um, taught Lisa reading, writing, arithmetic, geography, taught her all the basics of, of life. But more than that, he taught her some powerful principles about who she was. A Jewish teacher came into her life. And one day, Lisa was taken from, sorry, Lisa's teacher was taken from her. And she was shocked and shattered when she heard that Mr. Bergstrom was leaving town. And she ran as fast as little legs could take her down to the, the station at Springfield Railway Station. And as she arrived at the station, the train was just pulling away. And she cried out, Mr. Bergstrom, Mr. Bergstrom. And he hung out the train. And she cried out and she said, now that you're leaving me, just give me something that will help me live. And he pointed at her. And he said, you are Lisa Simpson. And the plane, the train took off out of sight. A Jewish teacher came into her life to teach her who she was. 2,000 years ago, a Jewish teacher came into planet Earth. And he came to teach you and I who we are. And if we don't know who we are, we'll spend our life trying to find an image that satisfies society. And it may well be a facade and behind us, behind it, we are struggling with, with all the insecurities and inadequacies of life. But if it seems to keep society happy, then we'll continue to play the game and hold up some image. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it tells me that God, who? God said, let us. Make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over all, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Aren't you glad, girls, you have got dominion over the creeps? God said, God said, let us make man in our image. I want you to notice something tonight. You and I were created by divine counsel. There was discussion in the boardroom of heaven. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, We've got a magnificent plan. Let us make man in our image. You and I are the consequence, firstly, of divine counsel and secondly, of divine design. And when you and I know that, when you and I understand that we are not just the the accident is a consequence of some accident in the, co in the cosmos. But you and I are the result of heaven itself planning you and I, man. That's when the second half of that verse begins to kick in for us as individuals. And let them have dominion over everything. Over what's in the sea, over what's in the air, and over what's on the land. 
when you understand the image you're meant to carry, the image you are carrying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. I want your every ear open. When you understand that, you begin to live with a sense of dominion in the earth. You, live, you walk through life, not arrogantly, but confidently. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't cast away your confidence because that's where you have a great reward. You want to see people that are successful in life, they have a sense of their self-worth. They have a sense of self-esteem and dignity. And when you and I come to Jesus, you know what he wants to do? He wants to strip away the plastic facades. He wants to open our eyes to who Jesus is, who we are in him, and begin to walk through life saying, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I am part of a royal priesthood. I've been chosen by God. There is royal blood flowing through my veins. I don't have to live life with my head hung down because of shame and regret. In fact, I'm a child of a king. My head's up. My shoulders are back. And I can walk through look out life I'm coming through see I've got dominion nothing in the sea nothing in the air and nothing on the planet has the right to rule over me except for the lordship of Jesus I've been created in his image and I can have a confidence that flows out of a self-worth you know why most of you lack confidence you don't think you're worth anything we put it down to shyness but it's a lack of confidence. And because we lack a confidence, we put people down that seem to have some. Because we lack a confidence, we shrink back from opportunities that God is opening up to us. Oh no. Oh no. Rise and shine. New Zealand, Eastside Hamilton Church. Listen, rise and shine. For your light has come. Oh, but I'm just, hey, you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You are part of God's redemptive plan for planet Earth. So get on with it, sweetheart. When you start to realize whose image you carry, there is a sense of self-worth. There's a sense of dominion. And you know what? Paul puts it in Romans 5, 17. We can begin to receive what he called the abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness to reign in life through Jesus Christ. If you're not reigning in life with a sense of your princely or princessly right and position on earth, it's possible you just don't know who you are. It's possible that you don't have a sense of I'm carrying the image of God. When the Bible says that God said, let's make man in his image, the original text that it was written in means that we are a shade or a resemblance of. On my phone, I've got a Motorola raise the phone and you flip it open. And I change the image on there fairly regularly. But right now I've got my two sons. They're 19 and 15, handsome young Australians. If you're the father of daughters about that age and you're rich, I'm keen to talk. <laughs> People say, tell me about your two boys. I say, you want to see my two boys? You want to see my two boys? You want to see my two boys? I get my phone out, flip it open. That's my two boys. But is that my two boys? No, it's an image of my two boys. It's an image. It's a reflection. It's a resemblance. It is a, something that was caught in a moment of time. And I can see what they're like by looking at the image. Let me give you a radical thought. Want to know what God's like? We were created to be a reflection. A resemblance of the attributes of God. When you understand that, a number of things happen. It's Sunday night, so I'm only going to give you three. I really believe this is going to help some people. When we realize that we were created in the image of God, 
Number one, we don't throw away our bad photos because they're part of our story. We don't throw away our photos, not the bad ones. These days with digital technology, it's, it's a little different because we can scrap bad photos there and then. But back in the last century when dinosaurs ruled the earth, we used to take our photos and we'd hand them in at the Photoshop and we'd like to go down and get them before anybody else was around. And we'd go through the images and go, oh, look at the way I'm holding my face. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Throw that away, throw that away, throw that away. Because we don't want the ugly photos. We only want the good ones because it's our job in, earth, in, in life to impress people. But can I tell you something? Even the bad photos... Even the ugly photos are part of your story. You come to my house now, my wife has got a favorite photo of the Alcorns. We live on acreage, and uh, a few years ago, we had a photo taken down above at the dam on the front of our property. And it was amongst the reeds and the weeds, and it was all kind of, you know, all rough and, and bush-like. And, and our boys were quite small. One of, the, one of them was missing a tooth or two. And uh, my hair was black. And I had, uh, I had a moustache and a mullet. <laughs> I looked like Magnum P.I. And people walk in that have never seen it and they go... <laughs> you see, is that me? No, it was. See, a lot of people actually think life is a photo. It's not. It's a movie. And a movie is just a series of images. I was in uh, the west of our country a, a couple of years ago, and a guy that I actually started out in ministry with a long time ago. And, you know, we both had small groups, and we were, you know, we were struggling little guys in ministry, and we're doing sorts of stuff. And, and he said to me, like, this is 20 years uh, that we'd only seen each other a few times. He said, you've changed. I said, what's your point? And I looked at him and I realized, you know what's tragic? He hasn't. Still thinking the same things, doing the same things, going the same places. It, it, and it moves on. And, and as we move in life's journey, stuff happens. I had to go to Africa in April. It was part of the 100 Days of Hope in the nation of Rwanda. And while I was away, just leading up to it, my wife was diagnosed with skin cancer, and it was on her face. And they said to her, you can't afford to leave this. This has to be treated immediately. We have to do surgery. And my poor girl, they said to her, you can leave it a few weeks if you like, but we believe you need to deal with it immediately. And uh, she decided that she'd have the operation while I was out of the country. And uh, they put a three-inch cut on her face, and they took the growth out, and only two weeks ago she was cleared. She doesn't need radium or anything else. We thank God for that. She's had a, had a complete clean bill of health, and that's a good thing. But while I was away, they did this operation. She was bruised from her eyebrows to her neck. She had a head on her like a melon. And my boys took photos of her. Because they wanted their dad to see what she'd gone through. Now, they're ugly photos. My wife's a really good sort. She is a really good sort. But I'm telling you, I look at her and went, hi yeah. In life, because of stuff that happens to us, there's some ugly photos that we'd prefer to throw away. That season, that moment, oh, We've all got photos, haven't we? You know, where you, 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 that, that somebody caught you and you had something nasty on your nose, or, or you, in, 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 in you, do, do I have to keep that? Well, when you realize you're in the image of God, you realize that the journey you're on, there'll be stuff that happens, and, and you won't dismiss them, you won't throw them out, because, like Moses, who looked over his life 
120 years of walking on the planet, he began to reflect back. And, and there were some good times and some great times, but he began to think of all the images. He remembered the time that he failed God. He remembered the time that he felt God had failed him. He went, remembered the time that, that people opposed him. He remembered the time he made some dumb mistakes. And yet he could, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, he could say, you know what? The eternal God is my refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He can say, you know what? I'm here today because God was there then. I do. I, I don't like those bad times. I don't like those ugly photos. But a faithful God saw me through. A faithful God saw me through when that thing happened in my marriage. A faithful God saw me through when I was going through that thing in my health. A faithful God saw me through when that, that problem happened in our finances. A faithful God, oh, I don't like that photo. But God was there. He's faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells me, my God is faithful and he'll also do it. He'll keep you. Even in the times when we've got those ugly photos. The second thing will happen when you understand that you're created in the image of God is you see other images differently. You see other images differently. You place value on people. We're here this weekend at Inspire, and we're here talking about things that build the local church. You know one of the greatest things to build a local church is create a culture of acceptance. And you're welcome, full stop. I love the way Pastor Nick stands up here and he says, Welcome, 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 welcome. Do you ever sit there and think, I wonder what he means? <laughs> I've got a funny feeling. He wants you to know that you're, you're welcome. A culture of acceptance. You see, people, people are doing life where because they, they don't seem to fit the image that some people want. They don't dress a certain way, don't do their hair a certain way, don't act a certain way. In a lot of situations in life, people are rejected. When they come into the house of God, you know one of the most important things that every human needs? Is acceptance. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, I love that verse. It says that we've been accepted in the beloved. It's a good thing. It does something to your self-worth when you know you're accepted. The host team here do a great job, but it's not, it's not just a job for the host team of Eastside Church. It's every one of us. That when I meet you and I encounter you, it's not, oh, I really only like you because you're this or you're that. No, you're accepted. You're welcome here. You are a reflection. You are created in the image of God. Whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, whether you're short, tall, white, thin, you are accepted. Somebody say amen. You're not helping me. You're accepted. See, when we understand this, we place worth on people not because of external things, but we place worth on them because of the simple fact that you are a reflection of an eternal, awesome God. Wow. Wow. Wow, that changes my view of you. It changes it radically. Our relationships find deeper foundations than the superficial stuff of the world. In verse 27, have a look at this. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Are you ready for this? Male and female, he created them. Male and female. God's not a sexist. God loves men and God loves women. We each carry a reflection of his image. And when we understand that, we realize that we are equal in value but different in design. I think there's nothing more magnificent than a woman who's free to be a lady. I think there's nothing more magnificent than a man who discovers that I can be a man. And I can be fully alive. And, and when I understand that you're created in God's image, 
And I understand that whether you're a male or a female, I live life in a way that, in, that is absolutely committed to not doing damage to that image. I'm not going to use or abuse that image for my own purposes. I've got a church full of stunning young women. Single, stunning young women. And we've got a bunch of men that are committed to protecting them. You come in to use and abuse to violate our girls, they promise to lay hands suddenly on you. You know why? Because they're their sisters in Christ. They're their sisters. And we treat each other with dignity and we respect each other. Our sexuality is kept under the lordship of Christ. Young people love it when you use the word sex in church. Sex. Sex, sex, sex. There you go. I, I meet young people that, that, that genuinely want to serve God and, and they, they, they just don't quite get this. They passed away. Just got a question for you. How far can we go? I said, what do you mean? I said, how far could we go? He said, you know, we love God and you know, we want to serve him. And, and we, just, we see our relationships really beginning to take some, some, some momentum forward. And we believe we'll actually marry one day. So just how far can we go? I said, do you really love them? Do you want to honor God with your life, with your body, with your future? Yes. Then I've got a good idea. You go to Scotland and you go to Africa. Don't use each other. Keep your relationships under the Lordship of Christ. Keep them in accordance with the, with the user's manual. It's all in there. It's all in there. When we realize that, you, that each other is created in the image of God, we tolerate people. And we, we have a rising intolerance for that which mocks, for that which rejects, for that which rates value, especially in God's family. God took me to a situation a few years ago where our church was asked to do one special night for a group of Christian mentally handicapped people. I tell you, it was one of the greatest life lessons I've ever had, just to see these people doing life. They, they, they were people with all sorts of things which, you know what, in society, some people would look down on them. Some people, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be even accepted in certain groups and certain, certain situations. But you know what, I saw the most incredible expressions of acceptance. Saw the most, the most wonderful expressions of love you could ever imagine. And I, I went home and I said to Lynn, could you imagine what the church was like if everybody behaved like that? When we realize each other is created in the image of God, things like racism become very ugly. Flying home from Africa just a few weeks ago, and uh, that continent's always riddled with different kinds of civil unrest and military uprising, and, and there's always just thousands of refugees that need help and support from nations like yours and mine. And I sat... In, a, in an area, I actually caught a plane that wasn't part of my, uh, the normal group of planes, airlines that I normally fly on, so I was put in row 476F, and I was right down the back. But I'm glad I was, because right behind me were 70 refugees from Burundi. And, and I met this group of people that were being airlifted from there to my city. And I sat beside an ugly Australian. He turned to me and he said, these people coming to our nation, they're wrecking it, aren't they? I said, I actually think we're better for having them. He said, but they're wrecking the Australian way of life. I said, you know what? I grew up believing the Australian way of life was to give everybody a fair go. 
I grew up believing the Australian way of life was, was to treat everybody as equal. I said, you know what? Do you know what I do? He said, no. I said, I'm a pastor of a church. I said, and you know, our church is being flooded with people like this. I'm, it's costing me a fortune to buy buses to bring African people to our church. And we are the richer for it. We are the richer for it. And the color and the life and the energy that these people bring, man, I tell you, they wear colors that I just could never wear. And they make it come alive. Because they, you are a part of the reflection and resemblance of the creator of the universe. And the third one, and then we close. When we realize that we're created in the image of God, you get a fresh comprehension of your worth. The Bible calls the devil the father of lies. And he loves to lie to people, especially young people. It says, unless you're perfect, you're useless. And he uses all sorts of things and people in our culture to compound that lie. I call it the Hollywood syndrome. The Hollywood syndrome simply says that, uh, you know, have a look at the glossy magazine, have a look at the, the perfect shape, the perfect face, and unless you're like that, you really aren't quite worth as much as others are in life. Question. What gives them, what gives anybody the right to say what another human being is worth? What, what gives anybody the right to rate the value of another life? I just, as I said a moment ago, came from Rwanda. It, it actually affected me very, very, very deeply. Because I was in a nation that had to invent a new word, genocide. It didn't exist in their language. They had to invent a new word to describe the horror of when one race rose up and said that race doesn't even belong on the planet anymore. It's not of any worth. And when I saw that, I saw how, how that, that, that a human mind can be so twisted by a lie of the devil who comes to steal, kill and destroy and saw the effect that it has. And when you start to believe that, Write these three things down, then I'm going to pray for you. If you start to believe those lies, it'll cause a low self-esteem, a depression that'll make you want to isolate yourself and not socialize anymore. I know young people that don't go out much because they've got acne. I know young people that don't go out much because of their jean size or their dress size. It's because that they, they've, they've watched the movies and they've heard the stuff that says that life's really only meant for, in quotes, the beautiful people. I've met some absolutely magnificent people that are several jean sizes bigger than mine. They're magnificent. They're absolutely magnificent and their character and personality resembles the greatness of an awesome God. It, it, it's a shocking thing to see how, how that, that lie has become such a restricting thing in people's lives. Another thing it will do is it will cause eating disorders. Now listen, I'm actually all for healthy living. All for it. Look after your body. But here's a simple fact. There's doctors in this room today that can tell you some people will never be skinny. Just never will be. Genetically, it's just not going to happen for you. You've got a frame size that's meant to carry a little bit of weight. Listen, be as healthy as you can. But don't believe a lie that it's only the skinny people that are really of any worth or that are of any beauty on the planet. We all carry the image of God. And I've watched people, I, I, I've watched young men even. We've definitely carried a number of people through. In fact, one young girl that uh, we hadn't seen for a few months, we, we just thought she was away. We found out she was hiding out. Saw her a few months later, and I couldn't believe it. This was a very pretty, sporty young girl who believed the lie. She was a size 10, but she thought she was fat. And I saw her, and I went, ah! 
She'd been starving herself almost to death to get the right image. And if you follow that further down, you'll find that a distortion of what really is beautiful and what really is of value can actually cause suicide because hope is lost and we can't meet the standards of the image setters in today's society. Oh, we need to be image conscious. Tomorrow when you go back to school or college or work or when you go back into your home tonight, I want you to look in the mirror. There's a little bit of God in there. But can you hear God say to the Son, Holy Spirit, here's an awesome plan. Let's put on this magnificent planet Earth something that carries our glory. And, 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 and if they can only get it, you watch how they do life. Musicians, come and join me. You might say, yeah, it's true. I, I believe that I was created in the image of God, but somehow or other, the image got damaged. Stuff happened. I did get used and abused. I got let down. So I, I know I, I was meant to carry the magnificence of God, but look what's happened to me. Do you think I'm still of any worth? Yeah, I do. You know why I know you're of worth? Because I know how much someone paid for you. I was in New Zealand last year. I was at my friend Paul de Jong's church and one of the guys on his staff found in the Auckland newspaper an amazing, an amazing article. It was in your, it was May of last year, it was in the Auckland News. It was about a guy who'd, who'd found a cello, cello. And he actually found it in one of those like skip bin things. And, uh, and he took it home and thought, I don't really want a cello. Silly old ugly thing anyway. I, I might actually open it up and make it like a neat little cupboard. <laughs> he was gonna turn it into a cupboard in his house. But before he did it, he thought he should just ask somebody, you know. Do, do, you know, do you know anything about this? It turned out that it was 300 years old. And it was worth approximately $2 million. It changed everything. Because they found out who made it, Stradivarius. They found out who made it, and once they discovered who made it, then that in turn told them what it was worth. And in fact, they found somebody that was prepared to pay the price for something that was of such value. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and he said in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. So do not become the slaves of men. Don't become a slave to the Hollywood men. Don't become a slave to the glossy magazine men. Don't become a slave to the men and women of a culture that says that you're not of worth because you are filling your own gap. I tell you, you're of worth because 2,000 years ago, God's most valuable asset was invested in the earth for God so loved what he created in his image that he gave he gave his most valuable possession his only son who died so that we could live 
and live in the fullness of life. Free, changed from the inside out. Aware of not only who I am, but whose I am. Bought with the most valuable price ever paid. The blood of the Son of God. Why don't we stand up and worship him in appreciation for that. Let's sing this song. Then you Why don't we raise our hands? And I fall, ocean short of your glory. Oh God. Yet you stood. You bestow value on us, awesome God. To make me great. To end that you. for a moment in a minute I want to pray for some people who've been damaged by the Hollywood syndrome there's young men and women who it's affected you socially physically emotionally you've been damaged by that stuff some have even been carrying those dark clouds of depression in your life because of this whole image thing, I believe tonight God's going to bring a freshness and a healing into your mind and soul. But before we even get to that, people are praying for you right across this room, friend. Some people brought you tonight because they, they, they actually knew that you needed to hear a message that tells you that God loves you. They, they've been praying for you more than today. They've been praying for you for weeks, months, some of them longer. Because they wanted you to hear the message that God loves you so much that he gave his own son to die so that you could live. But when he died, he didn't stay dead for long because the power of the Spirit of God raised him up. And the Bible tells me the same Spirit that caused Jesus to come alive again is available to you to make you become fully alive, changed, forgiven, life coming unbelievably alive to you in every form. But everybody bow your head because we're praying. We're not bowing our head for a spooky reason. We're just bowing our head to block out every distraction. We're bowing our heads to have a moment of reflection, to ask ourselves the question, are we fully alive? Do we know what it means to be really accepted by God? Here's what I know about God. God loves us just the way we are. But God loves us too much to leave us the way we are. He wants to change us, help us, heal us, forgive us. And it's our decision in this room. It's ours. God made a decision. He sent his son. Now the decision's ours. To respond to the wonder of that love that can change everything. That can start a relationship with the creator of the universe. But it's our decision. Some of you have been pushed away by people, rejected. Others were told that you were loved, but only to find that people said they loved you, only to use you. When you come to God, you're going to find the pure love. You're going to find a life-changing, life-giving love, not a life-sapping love. Tonight I'm talking to people that know they need a friendship with God. 
You've been, you've been hanging around church. You've been hanging around people. You, 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 for many of you, this isn't the first time you've heard this message, but tonight you're ready to say yes. And if that's you, we're not going to wait long. Because if, you, if you're ready to say yes to God, you don't need hours to decide this one. In your heart, even as we've been singing tonight, as you've been hearing what we've shared, your heart's saying, this is it. This is what you're looking for. So if that's you, raise your hand straight up and look me in the eye for the first time ever. Thank you, sweetie. Others, raise your hand up. Just How many others? Just say, yeah, that's me. Raise your hand up. Say, I'm looking for that love and that life-changing power of God. Rain, pray, pray for me right where I am. I'm going to look across this auditorium. Thank you. Others, just, I'm going to look from my left, your right, right across. If that's you, thank you over there on the side. How many others on the, in my left-hand side, your right? You're saying, this is what I need to do. In the middle sections here right now, you say, this, I, I know I'm ready to say yes to God. If that's you, raise it up straight away. Some have already. Who else needs to? And on my right-hand side, you're ready to say yes to God. I need God in my life. Raise your hand straight up. Say, yeah, pray for me, Wayne. Hold it up high. Good on you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. There's been a number of hands that have been raised. Can I ask you to put your hand upon your heart right where you stand? And I pray for you tonight that you would know the wonder of an accepting, awesome God who will come in and do what the Bible says, make everything new. May his life and love and power set you free to live life to the full from this night on. From this night on. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the people that look after the people that say yes to God to stand in the corner on the exit door. If you just head there, if you raised your hand just then, some folks here, some people there, why don't you just begin to head across and shake hands with them? Just slip out of your row. Nobody's going to be staring at you. That's it. Good on you. There's a young lady over there or two over there. Person there. Just, just make your way. That's it. People are heading across. Just don't be embarrassed. That's good. That's good. Just, just make your way. Some people there. People are going, I wonder what they're going to do to me. They're not going to do anything weird, I promise. They just want to help you. I want to give you material. Slip out of your row. Just head down there. And say, I actually made that decision just then. Just introduce yourself. That's cool. Some people are standing there. There's others that raise their hand. That's good. Some people are going. They're still chugging down there. That's it. Invite your friend. Just tap them on the shoulder. Say, hey, would you, you, uh, you want to come with me? I'm going to ask this great music team tonight to sing this song. I actually wanted to preach a funny message for you tonight. Because I can be a funny guy. And yet, you know, for about four or five days, I've known that tonight God wanted me to share this message tonight. I know that I know that I know God wanted to speak to some hearts that have been bound up by the stuff with a false concept of what the right image is. I'm going to invite you tonight for, for prayer. The leaders of this church, in fact, I want the leaders to just stand out here, just come out ministry team, elders, pastors, just to come out. Stand out the front here. God's going to do a healing work in a lot of lives right now. Don't let anybody leave if you can. He can stay. Naomi, I want you to lead that song. And as we start to sing, there are some young girls that this whole thing about your size and your weight, it haunts you. There are some young men that just that whole image thing has caused you, it's causing you depression. There are some people that it's, it's, it's been such a, such a strong and dark force in your life, it's even caused you to even have thoughts of self-harm. And tonight God wants to heal you. He wants to renew your mind through the power of the acceptance of the love of God and His family. And we're going to begin to sing this song. There's some people that have also just been carrying those, those photos and, and you've even been mad at God. God, why, why weren't you there when that ugly thing happened? You've been carrying this anger in your heart. 
you're still here. You're still breathing. Because underneath were the everlasting arms. He was there. Even when you can't see him, hear him or feel him, he's there. Some of us need to just let some of that stuff. Tonight is a night of letting some stuff go so we can embrace the fullness of life. And I'm talking, you know I'm talking to you right now. Just raise your hand and say, yeah, you're talking to me. Just come on, put your hand up. Get honest. Listen, you won't get healed unless you get honest. If you know I'm talking to you, raise your hand. That whole thing of depression and self-image and, and I'm too big and I'm too fat and I'm this and I'm that. I know God's speaking to people. Begin to get out of your seat. Everyone that raised your hand and go to somebody, your sex, go straight up to them. Some of them are going to put their arm around you. Just, just walk straight up and they're going to pray for you right now. Just begin to come. There are people that are depressed, seriously depressed, suicidal. Just begin to come. I'm going to need more leaders than this. Leaders, quickly come. Men, just walk up to somebody. They're going to begin to pray for you. And don't go back to your seat. Just walk straight up to somebody. I need some senior mums and dads in the house of God. I need some women leaders. Quickly help me. Quickly come. Quickly come. Youth leadership. Clive, get me some more leaders. Women leaders. In Jesus' name. Let the Spirit of God. Friends, you're either, you're either worshipping God or you're responding to His Word. Let's do it right now in this place. Come on, in this place. Ladies, go find some of these girls and love them in Jesus' name. the keyboards for a minute if there's any young man or older man here that's not being prayed for that's not got somebody praying for him just raise your hand we want to pray for you we got any girls young women or mature women out here right now that hasn't got one specific person praying for you right now raise your hand we want to help you we want to pray for you if you're out the front just everybody out the front listen to me for one second please listen to me even the counselors and people praying, would you just, just hold it for one second? Shh. If, you're, if you've responded and you know God's spoken to you tonight, I want you to open both your hands. You're being prayed for. Open, I want you to open both your hands. Prayer team, listen, you need to help me here. Prayer team, listen to me. I want every person out the front that's being prayed for, I want you to bow your heads and open your hands. Open your hands. Open them up. And I want you to let go of every lie that has been lurking in your mind and sitting in your soul about what's acceptable, about what's beautiful. Some of you, I want you to let go of an anger to God some of you, I want you to let go of that pursuit of that thing which is literally self-destructive. I want you to let it go in Jesus' name. And with your hands open, I pray that God would right now pour in a healing oil. I pray right now God would begin to do a restoration of your broken heart, of your distorted thinking. I pray that God would help you and heal you and bring about a renewal of your life, body, soul, and spirit. I pray that it would come to order under the influence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I pray for you that there would be a revelation of who you are, of whose you are, of what image you carry. And in Jesus' name, let there be a total difference in your demeanor. May your walk and your talk and your responses to situations carry the revelation of who you are. Your purpose in the earth. May there come a divine confidence and a strength to your inner man. In Jesus' name.